Thanks, Veronica, and uh, thank you for setting this up. I know this is always kind of like the exciting or scary time right before legislative session to know what's in the executive budget or and more importantly, probably not in the executive budget. So um, appreciate you all all the people who prioritize this to go through um, um, what was really in the executive budget and see um, we'll we'll likely reach out to Jessica Thomason. I hope many of you know um, over the human service side and I'm seeing a number of other HHS employees on here. So what I'd like to do today is walk through um, the process that we went through in order to develop the budget. Um, I, and I think it's important to emphasize during um, the governor's budget address, he talked a lot about using strategy to drive the budget versus programs to drive the budget. And we provided our strategy review to the governor back in, I wanna say it was June. And from June, that really led the development of the budget. Uh, the other thing I would share is there's, there's with, with the integration of HHS and some other things that have gone on, I may and other members of the team might not be able to answer all your questions at the end. Wanna save questions for that at the end and we'll commit to following up to answer those questions as, as best we can. But um, we just, I mean, the, the amount of time and effort and work that went into really looking at how do we um, do the best that we can as a health and human service agency through strategy, through input from many stakeholders is important. So with that, I will share my screen. Actually, let me do it differently. Because I would like to be able to see people. OK, can folks see the slide? The title slide. OK. Perfect. It's still loading. Um, so really, um, I think it would be good to go through some introductions today. I don't know if if Veronica, if there's if we think there's too many people on the phone, but I I re really would like to know who's who's on the call and go through that. And this is always one of those interesting struggles with how to best flow through everybody who is on. Um, and if we could just um, go down the list alphabetically, realizing that some people have their first name first and others have their last name first. But as you know, you show up as being at the very top. So as you get to your name, um, if you could, if you could um, just say who you are and what organization you represent. So I think um, the first one on on the list here is Aaron Chapman. OK, I'll, I'll just go down the list. How about that? Amber Durr. Amber Durr with Community Options. Thank you. Angela Dinius. Hi, Chris. Angela Dinius with the Association of Community Providers, and I also have some of the local Bismarck providers with me today. Great, thank you. Deanna Askew. Chris, um, Unit Director for Family Health and Wellness in the Public Health Division of HHS. Great, thank you. Catherine Barshinger. Good morning, I'm with Medical Services. Tina Bay. Good morning, Tina Bay with Health and Human Services Developmental Disabilities Division Section. See, I'll, I still say it wrong and I got Chris <laughs> on the phone and I can't even get it right, Section. Yes, oh, Tina, we'll make sure to put that in your performance evaluation. <laughs> I'm yep. joking. Borgie Beeler. Hi, Borgie Beeler. I'm with Calix, a DD provider in Minot. Thanks. Carlotta McCleary. Hi, I'm Carlotta McCleary, and I'm with Mental Health America of North Dakota, as well as the North Dakota Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Thank you. Courtney Coble. Hi, this is Courtney Coble, North Dakota Medical Association. Thanks. Wendy Danifelzer. I'm with DHHS Developmental Disabilities Division. 
section. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Um, Darcy Severson. I didn't catch that. I am the lead operations of the community officer. Okay. Deb Johnson. Hi, Deb Johnson, Prairie Harvest Mental Health in Ground Forks. Thank you. Dennis Pathroff. Good morning. Dennis Pathroff with the GA Group. Thank you. Senator Dick Dever. Interested citizen. <laughs> Donna Bizeweski. Hello, this is Donna Bizeski from Catholic Sorry. Charity, North Dakota, and I am the director of the corporate guardianship program for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Great. Dory Leslie. Good morning. I'm Dory, and I'm with Friendship in Grafton and Fargo. Thanks. Angie Dubovoy. Hi, Chris. I'm Angie Dubelvoy and I work at Minot Protection Advocacy. I'm a disability advocate. Susan the, Forrest? Yeah. Oh, Susan Forrester is on. Susan? Hey, hey Chris. I'm Hi. and everybody. I'm doing some special project work with um, the department. Thanks, Sue. Aaron Fredoff? Friedoff? Aaron Friedhoff. Um, I'm a disability advocate with PNA in Jamestown. Thank you. Gordon Haig. Good morning. This is Gordon Hauge with uh, oh. Easter Seals Goodwill. Long E on the end, Chris. Thank Long you. E. <laughs> Thank you. Dan, sorry about that. Dan Gulia. Hi, this is Dan Gulia with PMA. Thank you. Rebecca Gustafson. Good morning. Uh, Becky Gustafson with Protection and Advocacy in the Fargo office. Harley Crony. Harley Crony, I'm from Opportunity Foundation Family and Baby Provider. Thank you. Denise Harvey. Denise Harvey, Protection and Advocacy Program Director. Thank you. Jack McDonald. North Dakota YMCAs and uh, America's Health Insurance Plans. Thanks. Jeff Jacobson. Hi, Jeff Jacobson with Lake Region Corporation and Devil's Lake. Heather Jenkins. Heather Jenkins with HHS and the uh, superintendent at the Life Skills and Transition Center in Grafton. Jennifer Barnard. Jennifer Barnard, I'm co-founder of Triumph Incorporated in Jamestown. I also have the other co-founder, Ann Eid, here. Okay, Jessica Dargis or Dargis. Herb, I got it on mine. Dargis, uh, my name is Jessica Dargis. I'm with Enable and Club. I got it on mine. North Dakota. Um, I'm trying to oh, I have to put my speaker on about. Yeah, if you're not speaking, if you could mute, you thank you. Hear if you want. Yeah. John Larson. John Larson with Enable in uh, Bismarck. Great. Kate Rock. Good morning. Kate Rock with Independence Inc. in Minot. And Kathy Diane Freilich. Kathy Freilich with the North Dakota School for the Deaf Adult Outreach Services. Katie Jo Armbrust. Good morning, Katie Jo with the Grand Forks Housing Authority. Kristen Dvorak. Uh, Kirsten Dvorak with the ARC of North Dakota and the ARC of Bismarck, and I also have a 23-year-old with autism. You'd think I'd get your first name right by now. I'm sorry. I was just saying, come on, Chris. <laughs> Paul Colstow. I am with uh, Paul Colstow with uh, HHS. At the Life Skills Transition Center, I'm the clinical director. Uh, Kirby Kruger. Kirby Kruger, uh, Public Health Division, Disease Control and Forensic Pathology. Uh, Kayla Larock. Good morning, Kayla Larock, and I am with Protection and Advocacy in the Belcourt office. I'm a disability advocate. Okay. Senator Judy Lee. You just identified me, Judy Lee West Fargo. Thanks. S Susan like Senator Dever. Yeah, <laughs> Nicole Livdalen. Uh, Nikki Livdalen with the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. Pamela Mack. 
Hi, Pam Mack, Program Director with Protection and Advocacy. Uh, Mary Anderson. Mary Anderson, Able Incorporated Dickinson. Uh, Matthew McCleary. Matthew McCleary with North Dakota Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health and Mental Health America of North Dakota. Thank you. Chantel Meidinger. Good morning, everyone. This is Chantel, and I'm a disability advocate with PNA in the Bismarck office. I also have an adult son who receives services. Thank you. Melanie Gaby. Yeah, Melanie Gaby, I'm a director of public policy for the Alzheimer's Association, Minnesota, North Dakota chapter. Okay. Melinda Retzer. I'm Melinda Retzer, and I'm from Poppy's Promise in Bismarck. Melissa Hauer. Melissa Hauer with the North Dakota Hospital Association. Kim Mertz. Good morning, Kim Mertz with um, HHS. I'm the Section Director for Healthy and Safe Communities. Thank you. Mike Chosey. Uh, Mike Chosey with the Assistive Technology Act program, the states uh, and our nonprofits, North Dakota Assistive. Thank you. Janelle Moose. Hey, Chris, this is Janelle from AARP North Dakota. I'm the advocacy director. Great, Maria Nesset. This is Maria Nesset, uh, uh, senior policy advisor to Governor Burgum. Thank you, Rebecca Quinn. Rebecca Quinn with the Center for Rural Health. Thank you, Rochelle McGregor. It's Rochelle with Vocational Training Center in Fargo, and I have Scott Bertsfeld and Caitlin Berg with me. Great. Roxanne Romanek. Hi, I'm Roxanne Romanek. Um, I'm the executive director for Designer Genes, which is our Down syndrome support network, and a mom to a 23 year old with Down syndrome. Don Rorvig. Hi, this is Don Rorvig, and I'm a disabilities advocate with North Dakota Protection and Advocacy in the Grafton office. Good morning, everyone. Royce Schultz. Uh, Executive Director, Dakota Center for Independent Living in Bismarck. Thank you. Sandy Leland. Sandra Leland, sorry. That's okay. Good morning. This is Sandy. I'm the uh, director at Fraser Limited in Fargo and West Fargo. Mallory Sattler. Mallory Sattler, Domestic Violence Rape Crisis Program in the Public Health Division of HHS. Thank you. Um, Miriam Saylor Nyland. Good morning. This is Miriam Saylor Nyland. I work for North Dakota Protection and Advocacy. Scott Berlingame. Hi, I'm Scott Berlingame with Independence Incorporated, a center for independent living in Minot. Shelly Peterson. Hi, this is Shelly Peterson with the Long Term Care Association. Rachel Sinis. Good morning, this is Rachel Sinis and the legal director with North Dakota Protection and Advocacy. Tim Blasel. Good morning, Tim Blasel from the North Dakota Hospital Association. Uh, Toby Lundstead. Um, Toby Lundstead, interested citizen and um, mom to an eight year old daughter on the DD waiver. Thank you, Tom Alexander. Uh, Tom Alexander with the Minot Housing Authority. Thank you. Tom Newberger. Good morning, Chris. Tom Newberger, Red River Human Services Foundation with services in Fargo, West Fargo, Wapaton, and a few other smaller communities. You ever thought about doing radio, Tom? Um, what was that, Chris? I can't hear you repeat yeah. it. I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. Chris and I know each other. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Chris Christina Tulsath. I'm Christina Tulsath. I'm the Home and Community Based Services for Developmental Disabilities. Trisha Lee. Good morning, Trisha Lee from Development Homes in Grand Forks. Uh, Kristen Vandervorst. Kristen Vandervorst with Developmental Disabilities. And Vicki Peterson. Good morning, um, Vicki Peterson, Family Consultant for Family Voices of North Dakota, also a parent of a 20-year-old with autism, ID, and chronic health conditions. And Kelsey Wright. 
Hi, I'm Kelsey White. I'm a disability advocate for PNA in Bismarck. And I sure thought Jessica. Oh, hold on. I think I'm. Um, Jessica Thomason. Yeah, good morning. Jessica Thomason with the Human Services Division of HHS. So thank, I think I'm going to try to go through this, but Jessica is on here as as my co presenter as we go through this, especially um, for questions and other members of the team. Um, you know, if, if there's something I miss or or don't say correctly, I'm sure hopefully they'll speak up. <clears throat> so and then so what we want to go through is then the, the goal, um, which really came out of the previous legislative session is to make North Dakota the healthiest state in the nation and then the priorities and the action plan as relates to this and then can dig into specific areas of the budget as we go through. Um, but but like I said, this this was the starting point to our budget and this will inform where our efforts are within the budget and where the where the team and the governor would like to make continued investments, either new investments, sustaining investments or um, just operational. So again, the goal to become the healthiest state in the nation, and and many of you have seen these things before, but we're really focused on strong and stable families, services closer to home, early childhood experiences, our own efficiency processes, and well as working with stakeholders to improve efficiency, and finally um, have a high performing team. But as you know, we're, we, we serve health and human services, and in order for um, the citizens of North Dakota to be um, successful, we need to invest in the foundations of economic health, behavioral health, and physical health. And when one of those has a deficit, it, as you all know, it can often create a deficit in another. And the that last statement on the slide is we must do our wake in a way that gives everyone the opportunity to decide to um, be healthy, be active, and find disease early. I think the important thing that is embedded in there is all of the person centered practice work that is going on because it is not um, it's not the state to decide um, be healthy, be active and fight. that people need to be able to make their own choices and we need to work together to do that. So what were the priorities and action plans? So um, really broken into three separate areas. One is our key initiatives that we've been working on in the past, evolving what we're doing now, and then where are the new investment focuses um, going forward to 23-25. So I think there you probably wouldn't see anything new on the in the first column as it relates to behavioral health implementation, continue to transform home and community-based services, and then behavioral, physical, and economic health. Obviously, there's been a, a big lift by many people within the human services and um, health department as relates to doing the integration, and, and that has been a big lift. I, I would say that that integration work, um, I'll just be transparent, it was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. However, it's also work that I that there is so much opportunity going forward as we look at focusing on on children and families and adults and the overlap of different systems to really make the best investments possible. Not so much right now with the there isn't the same scarcity of dollars, but there is a scarcity of workforce. And so how do we organize ourselves as an agency to best leverage the workforce that we have? And there's continued work on on the social services and, and becoming more effective and efficient there. But the new investment focuses are really around kids' health, safety, and well-being. And safety and well-being is for adults. The lab infrastructure development, the treatment environment at the state hospital, and emergency preparedness and response. So here's the the forward progress, and you'll obviously the governor talked about most of these during uh, the budget address. But continue to expand successful programs like free through recovery and continuing to build on community connect, continue to build out mobile crisis services across the state. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the suicide hotline and, and 988 and first link continued um, support and improvement there. Continue to build on peer support and the 1915I and really our work to continue on just reducing stigma 
And I think there's there's been a lot of work on on reducing shame and stigma on on the addiction side. Um, but I still think there's and there's still work to be done. But I think it goes across everyone. How do we reduce stigma across all that we serve um, based on their own individual situations? Additionally, transforming um, home and community based services. So really trying to do everything we can to meet that foundation of housing, that foundation of where people want to live. How do we make the investments to support that across all condition types, all population types? Um, I think to the workforce question here, the upskilling of, of direct care professionals. Again, we, we have a deficit of people, so how do we continue to train individuals to do more as they interact with individuals who are receiving services and then continue to provide supports and supports for transitions and diversions across all service lines. And still making forward progress, I think you can um, read all of those. Um, I won't go through each one, but you know, I think there's there's things embedded in all of these. So even like how do we continue to look at, you know, the strength that North Dakota has in family and resources for kin caregivers that just isn't around foster care. That's around aging. That's around anywhere that we can provide supports um, to continue to um, allow families to do what they need to do to stay together and really want to continue to build upon that. Because again, from a workforce perspective, we can't just keep hiring more people thinking we're going to solve the problem and then continuing to put more money and then the wages keep going up. It's we, we really have to be thoughtful in how we leverage our most valuable resource, which is um, people who work in the state. Then finally, here's back now. This is to the evolving that that middle column. Um, what we've been doing as it relates to one team for DHHS. And again, this is like I mentioned earlier, and I want to um, point out again, um, it, it is there's so much opportunity to continue to improve how we deliver services, how we support providers, how we do the work that we do to really create the healthiest state in the nation. But there's a lot of change going on, and, and that's been been a focus of many of the team members. Um, but with that, many of you are probably aware that Medicaid continues to evolve, and this is one of the reasons that integration is probably um, has a has a lot of a benefit. But you know, back when Medicaid was first created, it was for um, sing single mothers, pregnant women and children and over time has continued to evolve um, quite a bit. It is it is much more than just that today. And I think the, the other thing to keep in mind is there's all the things that go into the state plan amendment, which is kind of your standard Medicaid services, but then we do all these waivers as well, and it has evolved over time, um, depending on who the administration is at the federal level. Um, Medicaid is seen as supporting more and more specifically as it relates to housing or so other social determinants of health outside of medical. And there's a lot of work that's going on in a lot of states on really leveraging that Medicaid funding formula to build upon those things. And then finally, I think just how do we continue to improve our licensing and certification experience? We've got so many different license types, so many different certifications. How do we have more of a said differently, a one stop shop for people to um, go in, get their license, get their certification, but then also try as best we can as a state to make the requirements the same um, based on um, from a population perspective. We have, for instance, like different licensing requirements for a child care worker than, a, than a, a foster care family. In some ways, what's the difference? I mean, why are we making them jump through hoops twice? Can't they do it once? So there's a lot of efficiency that could be gained in that area. And then continuing to work on social service redesign, a lot of the redesign efforts obviously stalled during COVID, but we have a lot of opportunity to um, 
redesign how we do economic assistance and really make it more seamless for for clients and be able to get them their benefits more quickly. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of talk and, and we need to do additional work in child welfare system redesign. Um, as you're probably aware, the department has been focused on family first implementation. Um, for those that aren't aware, we still have per capita wise one of the highest number of, of kids in foster care. Um, and really how do, if we're going to focus on strong, stable families, how do we provide more services upstream as it relates to that? And then I think finally, it's, it's more of an operational item, but how do we how do we address equity as it relates to the social service? Uh, model that we have today and making sure that individuals who are doing this work are being compensated fairly and equitably regardless of of where they are because they're all doing the same work and the reason that it isn't as equitable as it should be this used to be funded by property tax so historically those counties that had higher property taxes could pay employees more than those that had lower property taxes now that being said it's not a one-to-one -one, but typically those counties who had lower property taxes would have higher social service needs so as as we evolve that work is so important that we recognize um, equal work or managing the work to the pay uh, and then new investment um, on kids' health, safety, and well-being. I, I'm sure um, many of you are aware the the focus of the department on on building building child care across North Dakota um, from a workforce perspective, number one. But I think two, which is maybe being lost in a lot of this work, is we know that 95% of a child's brain forms by the age of five. And if we, and really, 80% is between the ages of zero to three. And when we look at the number of dual income households, which it's up to families what they would like to do. But if if we have children who aren't in, have affordable, accessible, quality childcare, they are not ready to learn by the time they get to kindergarten, which creates, creates more burden on K-12. And then if they're not where they need to be by third grade, it just creates an additional burden year over year over year. And it really, um, it really puts stress on the system, and that child could not necessarily be as successful as they could have been. A lot. I'm, I'm not sharing these slides with you only for purposes of time, but we spent a lot of time talking about risk and protective factors as we put this together. So, childcare is a very good protective factor going forward. Best in class is really our, our four year old or, or pre K continue to build that. We've had very positive feedback from kindergarten teachers about how kids are. The classes are um, those children who had best in class are more ready to learn and they're noticing a difference right away. Um, and with everything that's happened with COVID, those those teachers need that support and those kids need those supports. Continued focus on childhood obesity. Um, and then also part of expansion of Medicaid um, from a behavioral health perspective and protecting um, moms and children is extending Medicaid coverage from 60 to 35 days for postpartum care. We want to do everything we can to not separate families. So that's the crisis stabilization um, and support family and friends who can offer kids a stable home. So back to that kinship care idea that we talked about earlier. Um, I don't know if I'll spend much time on this, but there's there's been a hefty amount of work in, in replacing the lab um, for the state of North Dakota. The, it was a um, it was a lab that had a lot of infrastructure issues that they kept together with um, bailing wire and duct tape during COVID and many times would be um, shut down to to water coming through the roof as they did that and people would work under garbage bags. So um, very wise investment that the, the legislature put forward and continuing to build upon that in this legislative session. And then the, the state hospital, um, what is in the budget is just $10 million at this point um, to begin architectural design and that work. The acute 
inpatient psych committee has been working with with many of you on this work and because of just the discussions about what is the the right thing what is what is the state hospital look like for the state of north dakota um, want to make sure we didn't make assumptions on on what that needs to be but at the same time make sure that there is a significant um, ask as it relates to move this forward and then emergency preparedness and response Again, just really starting to rebuild. It's like they they had this massive, I'll just call it a party for the last two years. And um, there's gotta be some cleanup that needs to be done going forward. So how do we make sure that they have a moment to take their breath and and replenish, um, whether it be the, the technology, the cash, the comm system and the staffing. I mean, in, a, in addition to that, um, you know, using lessons learned from COVID. Don't wait a couple of years when you forget what worked and what didn't work. Um, really make the investment now when it's unfortunately still fresh in our minds. And then I want to talk a little bit about tactics because again, um, this, this, those are the new things that are going on or the big boulders that the agency is focused on. But as many of you know, that's not what just HHS does. Um, so uh, the things that are going on for us right now um, is just managing immense and continual change. If you look at HHS over the last couple bienniums, there's been significant investment, significant change, all for the better. I don't think anyone was saying that anything hasn't improved things. Obviously, there's always the cleanup that occurs after we try something new. But but we know that we can always continue to improve, but there is a lot of management of that continual change in managing the the folks who are are tired. As you know, I've mentioned the workforce shortage, um, but obviously the key ones are still behavioral health clinicians, child safety and protection, direct support caregivers and nurses, and how do we you know jointly meaning both within HHS and externally um, really focus on that. And that highlights that last dot point. Um, your challenges are our challenges as well, so it has to be approached um, comprehensively. Because again, I think oftentimes we think in silos, both the public side as well as the private side. And so the the agency is still trying to make sure that there's there's equity across the board, especially in a tight workforce environment. From a systems perspective, um, we, we are still one of the only agencies on a mainframe, both for our child welfare and our child support. And our that is part of our budget to move that forward. Additionally, there's been, and Jessica and her team have really moved this forward, but from a data analysis and data modernization, really putting the data together in a way that tells the story and, and where the improvement or deficits are. We still have a long way to go, um, but I think really getting more towards an analytical mindset and looking across systems, because again, back to the beginning of talking about economic, physical and behavioral health, we need to look at, at it as a whole and see where those gaps are and push those levers up and down. Um, I've talked a little bit about the redesign of delivery of services, whether it be eligibility determination, case management, provider enrollment. Um, I think one of the big things that I'm really excited about is right now within Health and Human Services, we have integrated the behavioral health policy and the service delivery, meaning there's no longer a behavioral health division somewhat separate from the service delivery and making sure that as we work together on the public side, we are aligned internally and then use that to then work with external providers as well. Continuing to look at it, um, character recognition or OCR and bots to, to do automation, another workforce, talked about the lab, continuing to do the integration. Um, we are going to push more and more of the rates um, within our budget to be tied to quality outcomes and complexity of care. And I think there's been um, a lot of good work that many of you are aware of. Um, I'd specifically call out um, long term care and the work that we've done with them really to change the way they are being paid related to 
price and other factors and complexity of care, and then building quality on part on top of that. Um, think that's I think that's a, a great model to talk about during session and going forward. Um, we are still trying to rebalance investment from institutional to non institutional, and, and that's that's really hard because at the end of the day, um, we know that we if we as you guys all know this, but if we invest upstream, we're going to lead need less downstream or deeper end. Um, but it's it's really hard to make that shift, but you you really have to be intentional um, and that really gets into that third dot point. And that the fourth and fifth dot point, I mean, really they're the right things to do, but it's become even more important because we can't have people not working at their full potential. And just to give an example, there's there's so many behavioral health needs across the state and there's only so many clinicians. And so everybody wants, and, and rightfully so, a behavioral prof health professional where there's needs, but there might not be that full-time need. So I think what we're trying to do is be very strategic and thoughtful that we don't want to put more money one place to not have someone work full time, but to be available to work with different systems to say, how do we how do we balance? How do we load balance all of those things? And then finally, on a policy side, um, I think that everyone on there is just kind of what I went through. Finally, um, I shouldn't say finally, almost finally, and then we can get into questions. Um, these are the things that you know every agency was talking about and that we spent a lot of time really talking about how we load balance across all the systems. But as it relates to inflation and in increased demand, um, we're seeing it everywhere. And so to that point of not having the workforce and then having increased demand, how do we make sure we're doing it as efficiently as possible? And then finally, the end of the public health emergency is is coming up. Who knows when? Um, if anyone could tell me, I think you should go buy a lottery ticket. But um, that work continues on and on and still waiting to know what's going on. Just encourage you. Um, information is out at, at that website right there. Um, if you go to the HHS website, it's the first thing on there as well. There are upcoming webinars, um, there's FAQs. There's some resources already put into that, but until we know when it ends, it's, it's hard to know when to start. And then finally, I think, I, I hope this came through, um, but I mean, we're really focused on how to become the healthiest state in the nation. Um, and it's not just from a behavioral health or a physical health or economic health. It has to be across the board. Um, and, you know, we look at the different reports. We haven't necessarily come up with the metrics that we're looking for that. There's there's a number of different reports that come out that are usually with three year old data, um, but want to be thoughtful on our initiatives as we as we move these things forward. And um, we, you know, there's we, we need to start to think of the investment in health and human services as also an investment in infrastructure, probably now more than ever. Um, you infrastructure is is all of these systems to support the citizens of North Dakota. So with that, I'm going to just, you know, Jessica, this isn't exactly the way I you and I kind of talked about it or thought about it, but are there any key points that you think I missed as part of this? No, actually, I, I I think you did a great job of covering a lot of information in a pretty short period of time. I would maybe just add, you know, especially when you're you're looking at this in total, perhaps for the first time. One of the things that I think Chris did a good job of calling out is that even though um, you may not hear HHS talking about, you know, a whole long list of new things in the budget, it is in part because there are so many ongoing multi-year, multi-biennium efforts going on. And those are those three slides where he highlighted really the multi-year effort around behavioral health transformation, the multi, you know, the multi-pronged efforts into physical, behavioral, and economic health, um, the multi-year effort to redesign how we deliver services. So those are all, those are, that's kind of the ongoing work that we didn't want to lose sight of in this, because sometimes we talk about what's new or what's changed or, 
or which is logical when you're talking about a budget, but there's also the ongoing. And I think um, I think you did a good job of highlighting that, that we feel like there's a lot of really important multi-year high priority efforts that the legislature has has made investments in and over over time and we continue to do that as well. Thanks, Jessica. So I think Veronica, I mean, I think just open it up for questions. I I mean, I really wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, so I hope people know that and then um, maybe just do it by raising hands, perhaps. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, that was a great overview. We appreciate you kind of sending a foundation for us. Um, I am happy to monitor the chat for questions or if people would like to raise their hand and Chris could call on them. There, I see that Tom Newberger raising his physical hand, but there's also an option under reactions where you can raise your hand and it'll be a little bit easier for folks to see. Would you like me to wait on my question? I can. No, go ahead. I just, if we get a lot, it might be hard for Chris to keep up. So right, go ahead, Tom. Well, thank you very much again, Tom Newberger. But uh, before my question, I'd rather have uh, Senator Judy Lee's question answered, Chris. You can look at it in chat, and then when that question's done, oh. I'll certainly do mine, or I could just read it. It's very quick. I'd rather go with Senator Lee first. Do you want me to read it, or do you want to find it? Oh, I missed it. Um, yeah, so to Senator Lee's question, um, absolutely. Um, definitely can can consider it. Um, and Jessica, I don't remember if I... Did we put it in just for special needs or was it more than that? So I think I, or, this is this is one of those topics we expect to be a topic of conversation going into the legislative session. I think there are you know several areas where the department is already moving towards making sure that there is um, support for kin caregivers, whether it's in foster care, whether it's um, for families with children with special needs, whether it's families with older adults or other health issues. There's it's it's a it's a very um, broad and I'd say um, important topic for everybody to be talking about now because it's also a corollary to the workforce issue, as you know, that when they're, when it's hard to find non kin paid caregivers, what are the roles for kin caregivers and how do you make that more possible? There's a ton of complexity to it, as I know everyone knows, including Senator Lee, who raised the question probably as well as anybody on the call. But I think to Chris's point, um, we're absolutely interested in trying to figure out what the path forward is and um, and seeing what the what, how the discussion unfolds. And Senator Lee, maybe you will have a follow up to that. I saw your hand pop up. Well, you expressed it so well, Jessica, I don't have to, but we know that there's a tremendous shortage of child care of every sort, and it's critical with special needs kids, and it's creating some real financial hardships for the families. So I, I, I'm really pleased to know that it's going to be part of the discussion, and I know that I had brought it up to Chris, but I thought it's something that the rest of the group might like to know as well, because I think we have to have some general consensus on where we might want these items to move forward in order to be effective when you get into the legislative session. We're not all going to agree on everything, but we've all got to at least accept the fact that some of some things need to be discussed and move forward for, for uh, potential approval. And so this would just be one. And if Thank I you. could offer just a quick follow up before we leave this topic, I think that the other part of this discussion is the the idea of inclusive childcare too. And, and inclusive settings and so not only having having more options for family and kin caregivers when that's appropriate but also making sure that there are meaningful options for um, inclusive supported child care settings as well so i think again lots of robust discussion to be had um, and excited to see where that goes all right let's go back to tom and then we will revisit the chat all right, thank you. And again, as probably some of you know, uh, Senator Judy Lee is from District 13 in West Fargo, and she's done an amazing job uh, for all the years. And Judy, I hope you stick around for a lot longer. So, but anyway, uh, Chris, uh, my question, I may have missed it. Uh, I had a phone call I had to take. It was a brief one. But what is the inflationary increase that DD providers, intellectual disability providers received in the governor's budget. I have not seen that yet. Yep. And was there a wage increase per hour? Because in the past, when inflation has gone up, they've given a dollar, they've given other things. So was there an inflationary increase at what percentage? And again, what was the dollar amount of the hourly wage increase if there was one? Thank you, that's my question. So the Medicaid inflation rate is four and three. And Jessica, I don't believe there was a dollar per hour at all. 
in the budget. That's correct. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Chris. All right. We have Janelle Moose um, with her hand up. Janelle, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Thanks, Veronica. And, and Chris, this is either for you or for Jessica, but I know the governor outlined um, funding for home and community based services, and I think there were some additional FTEs. Do you have more details on what exactly that is included in the budget? I'll give that to Jessica. She's sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that. So there were um, um, a series of items that um, ended up being included in the executive budget for legislative consideration, um, and that includes some staff to try to help um, relieve the pressure on um, really on the front line of this home and community based service transformation, which is case management. And so some additional staff um, to move into home and community based service case management, in addition to a couple of um, new roles that we think can help case managers spend even more of their time directly with families and with uh, the individuals served and calling them um, navigators. Uh, people to really help do some of that matching if uh, an individual has services authorized and they need to find a provider that that uh, they can work with. These navigators might be able to help them do that, whereas case managers sometimes struggle to to take all the time that that would be needed to, to help make those phone calls and make those connections. So really um, trying to use uh, any additional resources that go into that staffing group to help make sure that we're meeting the demand, which, you know, again, one of Chris's previous slides noted, there's quite significant increased demand um, in people who are looking for options for themselves or someone they love um, to be able to live in a home and community based setting. All right, it looks like there's quite a lot of conversation in the chat regarding um, specific budget um, numbers and details. Um, I see um, our representative from the governor's office shared um, a website that people can get a little bit more information. She also um, put in there some information on the FTEs question. Were there specific questions um, about well, can I just, an area of can, spending or? Go ahead. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the decision packages as well as the budget is out there. The other thing that I would share um, on top of doing um, HHS integration, the fiscal team um, one implemented a, a new budget system um, during this interim and bringing Department of Health in. And the budget was developed um, based on what our understanding was in, in doing a HHS budget. Um, just as of recently, we learned that we need to split the budgets back up again. So it has created a little bit of um, work for, for the legal and fiscal team right now to begin to unwind those budgets. So um, some of this <clears throat> has created, you know, additional, I'll just call it anxiety and tension um, among, and would ask that as we go through this, we'll, we'll get information to you as soon as we can, but would just ask for some grace as it relates to that as well. Um, but you can see where um, the information is per Maria um, in the chat. And Chris, I'll just maybe for clarity, when you say split the budgets, it means how the, the overall department budget will be heard in the legislature. So which if you take the whole HHS budget, how do you have to actually split it up based on how it will be heard? Right. That's that's kind of exactly. Yeah. So so said differently, um, now the budget will be presented um, as department of as it has been in the past as 301 and 325 Department of Health and Department of Human Services. And we just we weren't as prepared for that coming into session. Um, we actually learned about that on Tuesday, so. All right, thank you. Let's move on. Roxanne Ramonic has her hand up. Would you like to go ahead, Roxanne? Yep, just circling back to the conversation about inclusive childcare, Jessica, are you looking at new investments in the inclusion support? So um, as part of the um, early childhood package that's in the executive budget, um, we do definitely have inclusive child care and inclusion supports included in there as, as part of that, that package that moves towards greater availability. So hopeful that that will be considered positively as it moves into the, into the session. But yes, it's, it's part of the executive budget that's going forward. Would you be willing to say to what extent? Like, I mean, um, are you seeing an increase in the grants and an increase in being able to con or you know handle TA. So I'll say at, at this point, Roxanne, we have a uh, there's a package of dollars that are available to go towards um, 
child care provider program incentives, grants and supports. Inclusion is in there. I don't I don't think that we have specific policy level detail to to share at this time, but I would say generally the goal is to make sure that there is more dollar support to help. There's more technical assistance support. There's more um, creative thinking together about what long term staffing support looks like. So I think all of the above, but I don't I, I really don't have specific details that I can offer at this time on that. The yeah, detail. But, yeah, and Jessica, not to but what was the number we put for all of those? Seven Wasn't million dollars is in that bucket. Yeah, so seven. Shared, so yeah, shared yeah. services, inclusive um, child care, um, startup uh, grants. So there's a number of different items that are that are in that package of um, overall supports. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I don't see other hands up at the moment or anything new in the chat. Um, feel I free can't to believe that. start that Come there. On, um, I'll keep you busy with just a couple um, items I was wondering about as we went through your presentation. Um, can you talk about um, what may be included in this proposed executive budget regarding um, any recommendations brought forward by the Alvarez and Marcel study? Yeah, so as it related to the Alvarez and Marcel study, um, I think as it relates to that, being being that it was a legislative study um, going forward, and we are completely supportive of that going forward, just want to go through that legislative process with the stakeholders because it, it did just come out. Um, and I do know interim human services did bring it up at their last meeting in Fargo. Um, and to that end, there isn't anything in the executive request, though there was discussion about it. So need to see where, and Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add that it was really partly timing um, as well, that the Alvarez study was still going on um, while the budget recommendations had to be developed. And so we didn't want to presume that we would know what the recommendations would be and that study wanted to be very respectful of that process and so just wanted to add that that it's not a, a lack of interest or willingness to move forward with the recommendations in the study but they really did come after um, the development of the budget would have required us to have kind of detailed information and we didn't want to presume what the recommendations were so nothing uh, nothing specific called out in the executive budget really with that as a primary reason if that's fair to say Chris yeah Thank you. It looks like we have Mary Anderson with her hand up. Mary. Hi, Chris. I you talked briefly about lack of workforce that is available to us. And um, certainly sometimes you have to pay more money because of that, but we just lack bodies. And I wondered what plans were being made to attack this concern. Yeah, um, I mean, it's 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 really multidimensional. Um, I think as it relates to there was a maybe I didn't do a great job of it, but a couple slides of how do we upskill different workers to do um, to learn more and and maybe as you learn more, actually earn more money as well um, because you increase your your skill set going forward. Um, but I think the other thing the the child care is is a huge component to um, really supporting families so that if both parents want to be in the workforce that they can. There's an also a number of things within the commerce budget as it relates to growing workforce. So I don't want to minimize that as it relates to a, a focus of the governor going forward. There's there's a whole host of items and I'm certainly not um, informed enough to be able to rattle them off the top of my head or have looked at them enough. But I think the other thing that you bring up is is you know all of the direct service providers, um, and I'm including anybody who provides any type of direct care. It's just so important that as we look at um, the amount of resources available as a state, we're being as thoughtful as possible. So everybody's raising the boats and racing to get that last employee and adding more money to it is just not going to solve the problem because Mary, your point is right on. Um, all we're doing is 
creating inflation, increasing costs, and and not really making a difference. And it, we all know, especially in the services that you all provide, when you have turnover, you don't have the same level of quality and safety. So we we have to be thoughtful about people not chasing extra dollars because especially in some of those areas, I mean, they are um, in those areas that have um, lower income. They're not they're not high income positions and a dollar here and a dollar there makes a definite difference, especially in what's going on with inflation. So how do we be really thoughtful about how the investments are made across the entire system? And I'll just add one thing that it's another example of of how something might not necessarily show up in a budget, but it can be part of how we think about this. So, it, you know, when you're delivering services to people, sometimes there's only so much efficiency to find. Sometimes it takes it takes people, but we can also look at the environment where the services are delivered. And are there things that we can think about creatively that help that environment also be part of a person's support? So everything from assistive technology to some of the home modifications or um, equipment modifications that are possible, any any of the smart home things, any of the, the creative ideas that are out there to let the environment be part of the support to really help, um, like you said, Chris, focus that very scarce um, resource of a human uh, service delivery uh, person by having the environment be part of it. And some of that is policy and practice. So some of that is just making sure that we're really thinking creatively together, together that our policies, our practices are aligned to let us do that, to take advantage of all of the um, all of the options that seem to be proliferating just about every day. So I'll, I'll throw that out just as a, you know, as another element of how maybe all of us thinking together about how we attack the, the workforce challenges, which are very real. I think the governor referred to it as our math problem. So even yeah. if you had all of the people in the state who were looking for work get a job, it's still not enough people. It's, it's a math problem at some level, and so it really does require some creative approaches. Yeah, and to that end, Jessica, I'll be even more blunt. Um, and I'm just a question for you, Jessica, and maybe I've, I might have forgotten, but was there anything we were doing with the Home Builders Association and Mike Chosey's group? Did that yeah. happen already? It has not happened already. We're hoping maybe spring or summer to really do almost like a, a human service focused expo on, you know, think of like a home show, but with a focus on assistive technology, smart home design, um, thinking about environments. So it's it's an idea at this point, but if you look at some of those other slides, it didn't make it to the top of the priority list in the last couple of months, um, but still, still looking at, you know, harnessing some of the excitement of many of you on this call have been in conversation with each other and with us about options that we should consider. And so I'm hoping that that's on everybody's agenda here coming up in the next. Yeah, summer. I know I, not, I'm not trying to give you a, a advertisement, Mike, but I do think there, there's so many different assistive technologies that you have. And then to um, Borgie's chat on the side there, like how do we work together to figure out how do we keep people safe, but really build up on that technology side of things and, and get comfortable with it? Because I really think there's so much we could do to keep people in their home and keep them safe. And we just have to be really thinking differently about how we do these things. Because I'm going to say this, and I, I always get scared when I say things off the cuff and they get taken out of context. But, you know, sometimes all of the all of the laws and policies are put in place really to keep people safe and they have the best of intentions but sometimes we we can't meet all of them and then when we have a workforce shortage and people receive no services it it it's actually worse and i i just think we have to be really thoughtful about you know what can we get comfortable with to let people live on their own and support them so anyway thank you it looks I'm like senator judy lee yeah, can I? Because I'm late to another meeting, but I want you all to know that there's $19 million in weatherization funds from the feds as a part of the COVID drop uh, that did not get moved forward by the budget section and the emergency commission at the end of uh, in their last meetings, but needs to be immediately. That $19 million is a big deal to help people with insulation, new furnaces, new roofs, the kinds of things that can make them have safe homes in which to live, and it will blend in with this. So please talk to your appropriators 
and uh, mentioned to them, this is terribly important and it should have been moved forward. It was not. And I'm terribly disappointed they didn't do it. But we should be looking at taking care of that, Senator Dever, right, right away in the beginning of the session to see what we can do to make sure, because it comes from the feds directly to commerce. It doesn't go through the appropriations process. Directly to commerce, it is distributed through the community action agencies. And so it's something that we should be using, not next year, but now if we possibly can. I'm off. Thanks, everybody. I got to go. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, let's pop back to the chat for a moment. Uh, Kirsten Dvorak asks, can you please talk about getting rid of the autism voucher? Yes, yeah, so that was something um, we had proposed during last session um, to get rid of the voucher. And what we wanted to do in this is to continue with, you know, what we've talked about, which is somewhat part of the Alvarez study. It's somewhat pushed up, but at the same time, make sure that the autism waiver was then fully funded. So there's in some ways it's just a shift of funds. And I don't know, Jessica, if you want to, if there's anything to add with that, but that's that's how that went. All right, we'll move on in the chat. Borgie Beeler um, mentions allowing billing for remote services permanently would be helpful. For example, allow staff to support a person over FaceTime rather than driving to an apartment. Thoughts? Exa well, exactly, and I would kind of referencing, you know, the work that we do with with technology. If, I mean, I, I think there's there's the FaceTime component, but there's also we, we would need other type of tech in the home or tech in their in their housing situation to make sure that they're still safe. Um, I know that Abel and Dickinson, I went to their ICF a few years ago and they have a lot of tech in there that probably now is not that expensive to put into homes. And how do we do that to really support those that we serve? So, I mean, I think it's a it's a combo approach really. I'll keep kind of pushing us along here. Darby, Darcy Severson asks, is there a projected increase in FTR and CC reimbursement to increase peer support services moving forward? Yep, and the best policy advisor in the governor's office has the has the answer right in there. Thank you. Oh, Maria. perfect. Yes. OK, um, Melissa Hauer asks, can someone please provide information on how much savings the HHS budget proposed for Medicaid value based payments to health care providers? Zero. OK, then I'm going to go back to people who have their hands raised. Thanks for your patience. Roxanne. Hi, I'm back again. Um, you talked, Chris, about the resources for kin caregivers. I'm wondering if that is um, you're considering family to family supports in that um, experience, parent supports through early intervention um, and what that might look like. I think it, it oh, do you want to go, Jessica? Maybe you'd be better. Yeah, I'll just I'll say maybe the simple answer is when we talk about kin caregiving, it doesn't include it doesn't include peer support or family to family, things like that. So kin caregiving is truly focused on family caregiving. So that's maybe the simple start of the answer and I'll let you pick it up, Chris. Yeah, and that, that's right. But to that end, and I hope you've seen this theme. I mean, we have to think about how we do our work differently given our workforce challenge and to put, to put something in around kin care and picking one versus the other and really saying as a theme, we support kin care um, and keeping people in their homes and if they have their their social supports around them, but to pick one over the other and determining where the legislature is. And, and I'll be honest. Um, I hope you always think I'm honest, but. Um, you know, there some of this family caregiving. If we came into the legislature and said we are going to pay families to be parents even though that's not what we're saying and that's not what any of us are talking about it, that is how it could be viewed. And so really be, being thoughtful about how we go into that and saying we support kin care, we need to be thoughtful about how we do it, but not coming in and say have a legislature, legislator come in and maybe just kill it out of the gate saying, well, we're, why do we have to pay parents to take care of their own family or their own kids? That that's that's Chris Jones's editorial comment. That 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 was that was my fear. 
I appreciate that. I guess what I was more specifically asking is the funds that you've had in your budget around family to family supports, peer to peer supports for families of children with special needs um, and whether that it, there's continuing to be those dollars in the budget. Jessica, I'm almost sure those are still in there. Are they yeah, not? I, I am too, but I, I haven't. I'm to be fair, I haven't seen a, a line by line budget come back from OMB, yeah. so I, I I don't think there's any difference, but um, we should we, follow up once we have the information. Thanks. So yeah, so said differently, we didn't take it out. Um, and I'm not <laughs> saying that like and I and I'm 99% sure OMB didn't and the governor didn't take it out either. It was part of our base budget. I appreciate what you're saying too, Chris, and I, I think um, it, it's it's the way that we talk about these things, and I, I do agree that it's um, got to be intentional, but we have a lot of families out there who, and it, it's another concern I have, who aren't utilizing the services that they're authorized because they can't get those services. Mm -hmm. um, and I am concerned about what that's going to look like in the budget um, because can name off 10 people right now who are not using their authorized hours for in-home supports um, because they cannot get staff or the staff they can get aren't qualified enough to do the job. I may be familiar with that, Roxanne. I bet you might be. All right, let's move on to Toby Lundstead. Did you have a question, Toby? Um, I guess. I've never gone to one of these before, so it's kind of like a statement to build off of what Roxanne is saying, give a little bit of background about our lived experience and just um, express gratitude for the fact that um, you guys are thinking about creative ways to better support families. Um, I had to quit my job two years ago because we cannot find staff to take care of my daughter. So that has impacted my my family personally, and we still can't find staff to take care of her because of her needs and turnover rates and all sorts of things that several people um, that I know in my circle of friends and family um, are also experiencing. So I'm just really excited to hear that um, the need or that people understand the need for creativity and and helping um, families like ours um, function better, stay together. Um, and I do agree, Chris, that we need to make sure as things go forward that people understand um, if we get into, when, I should say, when we get into the realm of paying family caregivers, that it's not paying a parent to take care of their own kids because Caring for my eight-year-old is significantly different than caring for my eight-year-old nephew. Um, so it's a different level of caregiving. And so I just wanted to express gratitude for the open-mindedness that seems to be in this meeting. Um, my voice is shaking because I'm a little emotional because of how excited I am. Um, the other thing, you know, you guys were mentioning um, smart homes and technology pieces and, and doing all sorts of like home modifications and different things like that um, for families to make it easier for families to stay together, stay at home, um, make sure that their houses are set up for an individual who need, has accessibility concerns. Um, yesterday, a large number of families found out that a private funding source um, that we typically rely on to help pay for these items because they're extremely expensive and not covered by insurance will be dramatically changing in the next couple of years. And I don't know if that is something that gets addressed by the state, but there is going to be a huge gap. Um, you know, our, our family alone has utilized this funding source for several things to enhance my daughter's quality of life that we would not have been able to get um, without this funding source and it's going to be gone for families. Um, so just something else to make everybody aware of, I guess. Sorry, there's not really questions in there. But. No, but I, actually, Toby, if you could share what that is with both 
Jessica and me, just so we're aware. Again, and um, you know, this is the executive request based on what we know at the time. But to the governor's point that this is being built on strategy, our strategy, our service is closer to home, put more dollars upstream. And there's a recognition. I mean, should you want to continue to care for your child at home? Um, it, I mean, aside from me personally thinking it's the right thing to do, but I guess I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, it actually saves the state money if you do. Um, and want to, I mean, so that's those are those are the investments that the governor and this agency is talking about. So want to continue to support that. I mean, we we have to. I mean, when we say we want to deinstitutionalize for those who don't want to meet, be in institutions, that's not just saying. I mean, that's that's really what we tried to build within this executive budget. Um. So as much and 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 to your point toby too and i don't know um you know as much as we can educate legislators on, i mean i think you had a good point caring for your eight-year-old daughter is different than your eight-year-old nephew um and i know that's hard to show up at the legislature but i i do think being able to tell those stories and then oh by the way the state would save money so you, I mean, it's it's a win-win for everybody, and I don't want to make this about money, but sometimes it is. And I think as best as you guys can tell those stories, I mean, I I hope no one is disagreeing with our with our strategies. I mean, really, what we're trying to do and where we're trying to make focused investments, and it doesn't happen overnight. But you know, you guys have a powerful voice, and I would just encourage you. Um, hopefully, if you agree with the strategy. <laughs> um that you would come in and and share those stories but i know it's hard i so all right we have one more hand raised before we go back to the chat denise do you want to ask your question um yes just in helping people to stay in the community in their the most integrated settings looking at supported housing i would recently heard about medicaid demonstration waivers but could you comment on funding and the budget for supported housing for people with mental illness jessica i don't remember that we put anything in there for that did we i don't think there's anything different um, or new proposed other than continuing to um, start to see the impact that the 1959 state plan amendment can have um, across the state. So I, I don't think that there's a um, anything separate or new related to supported housing for people with mental um, mental illness. We can verify that to make sure, but I don't I don't believe so. Okay. All right, we'll go back oh. to oh, go ahead. No, I just hopefully 1959 there'll be providers and some assistance through that too but always a need always more of a need in that yeah. area so and there are there have been mm -hmm. just in recent weeks a couple of um i think good good news um um additions to 1959 back from cms whether it's some of the you know conflict of interest provisions that had made care coordination difficult and i know um the medical services and behavioral health teams have been working really hard to show cms with some of our early data has indicated were barriers in North Dakota. So um, uh, I'm sure I'm sure Krista and others will be sharing more information about that if they haven't already. Thank you. Katie Jo Armburst in the chat says it's her understanding CMS does not allow for HCBS reimbursement for travel time without the client individual in the vehicle. Is this something HHS has looked at funding to support the rural nature of North Dakota? Um, Katie, could I ask, are you talking about um, staff travel, say, to where someone lives? So um, the time it takes for a staff person to get to the home where services are delivered? Yes. Thank you. So I think um, I, I think you're right. While you can't compensate specifically for that time, um, North Dakota has um, been ha has adopted the rural differential concept in a few areas, and I know that there is talk about how that rural differential could maybe be applied even more broadly. The idea there is that the rate that is paid for services delivered in certain areas, if it meets CMS's definition for this rural differential, can be compensated at a higher rate, which then 
essentially allows you to back into that the challenge that you've noted, which is the time it takes for staff to get to um, uh, decentralized locations is a, is a very real cost. So North Dakota does utilize rural differential in a couple of areas, actively in discussion about where and how it may be allowed for us to use it in in others as appropriate. And Chris, I, I hope that's OK. Yep. OK, to say oh, yeah. that that's that's how we're thinking about it right now, Katie. I appreciate that so much. Thanks, Jessica. Yep. Yeah, but if I could even add on to that a little bit, because again, this still gets to the workforce and it, it doesn't necessarily tie maybe to this to this stakeholder group. But again, this this whole idea of upskilling and providing services in homes and well, I guess HCBS as it relates to the aging population. How do we make sure we don't continue to create create new provider types thinking if we create a new provider type, we're going to hire someone else to do that job. And so then you've you've bifurcated or trifurcated that person who they could make a visit to one home and provide services and compensate them, you know, across the board for those, say, three different service types, instead of saying you need three different people to provide those three different services. Um, and I think clients would like a more personal relationship with the worker who comes in versus having a relationship with three different, but that that's an assumption I'm making personally. And I think that's a, I mean, I think that's just a really important point to note that conceptually it sounds so logical and so common sense and to make it actually happen in systems is kind of like moving mountains. And that's, I think, the kind of the behind the scenes work that happens that all of us are involved in every day. A couple of those slides talked about the, what, what does it take to meet the moment? It's that kind of stuff, having, having systems and practices that can actually allow that sort of integrated care thinking to be possible. So it's, um, Anyway, I think that's I mean, I, that's what I think about when we say something logical and it seems like it should be common sense and doable to remember what it takes to actually do that. And that's sometimes how things show up in the budget is what are the investments that it takes to make those common sense care approaches work. All right, we'll move on to our next question from Carlotta McCleary. Uh, she states they have families who can provide care in our aging population. Could we do something similar for the children's system? So a lot Carlotta, of oh, oh, go ahead, Jessica. I was just going to say, I think that 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 is one of the big questions up for discussion. And and um, Chris mentioned it earlier that there's um the complexity comes in what is considered your um, everyday responsibility as a parent. And so I think it's finding that line in policy and practice and law and rule and funding sources that makes the children's discussion um, you know, take on a different tone and complexity sometimes than what seems like a very similar discussion for adults. So I, Chris, you probably have a better way of saying that, but I think I think that really is the the difference there is that assumed caregiving responsibility that parents have for their minor children. And how do you draw that line as as Toby so eloquently did before? How, how do you draw that line of of what that looks like um, when you're putting it into policy and practice across across large systems? All right, we have another question in the chat. Dan Golia says, will we see assistance for 1915I enrollment, either employer or consumer, in January? Yes, yeah, so not necessarily part of our budget, but we have outsourced our provider enrollment um, to Noridian. And based on, and when we when we did that, that was primarily focused on, on the medical side of things because, um, and then we've added it HCBS and then 1915I was new. And um, for numerous reasons, we haven't, or they, I, I don't want to blame them, but they haven't been able to hit their service level targets as it relates to that. So we are in contract negotiations now to see, you know, what we can do to partner with them to improve that. All right, we have a few minutes left. I think there's a lull in the chat right now and I don't see hands up. So I will ask you one of my questions that I took when, that I came up with when you were talking. Um, you mentioned $10 million for a new state hospital. Can you talk a little bit more about your plans for that? It's it's really just, uh, um, you know, really saying we we have to get this started. Um, the, the governor in 2017, um, put it in his budget, put it in again 2019. 
think there's a lot of discussion about what it is and and just trying to move the ball down down the down the court or down the field. I don't know the right analogy there, but um, you know, I think there's been a lot of good work done during um, the interim committee for inpatient acute psych. But again, this uh, this has to be a, a system approach too. Um, it it you know it it absolutely does, and maybe more clearly defining the role of who we serve in the state hospital is one thing. Um, but there's obviously expectations across the system because if if one part of the system isn't working, it the whole system doesn't work. Um, so just need to make sure we have clear roles and accountabilities as it relates to that. All right, another question. Does the executive budget include an increase for personal needs allowances? Well, Jessica, I mean, I know. Well, here, here's what I would say, um, and then Jessica can correct me. But generally speaking, you know, inflation for provider rates and other things within the HHS budget have been oftentimes biennial things. But personal cares allowance, spousal impoverishment, you know, the things they haven't been adjusted for years and they have inflation as well. So we tried to make sure that all of that is addressed. I think we maybe missed some things, but um, that was really a focus. So I don't, Jessica, you could probably do a better job than me. No, I, I think that's accurate. And, and thank you, Maria, for for pasting in the chat. I wanted to make sure I wasn't speaking out of turn, but yeah, we did we did include um, in the executive budget and it was brought forward by the governor's office um, increases in personal care allowances. All right, um, it looks like Carlotta McCleary has her hand up. Carlotta, would you like to go ahead? Yes, <clears throat> so I know that there is some talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, technology and really helping with um, um, assistance for individuals that have disabilities trying to live in their home. Um, in our own personal situation, our son Garrett is losing his um, care staff that he has to keep him in his home. And there is an opportunity for um, um, an electronic kind of monitoring type system to really assist. And they're really getting a lot better in some different areas that they can assist in. Is there going to be some um, funding for that kind of a thing um, so that uh, it's, I mean, I know that we're going to be trying to do some things, but oftentimes that is couched in the fact that if you want that assistive technology, um, he would have to pay for that out of pocket. So I can say that um, it's one of the things we have um, included in the, what we kind of call that 10% HCBS plan, that's section 9817, which was part of COVID funding that came through to the state, that there's some dollars in there for early you know, pilots before we can do whatever, if there are changes that need to be made in policy or practice or waiver or whatever it is, before that can happen, we wanted to do some some piloting with what might be possible with some of those more flexible um, you know, HCBS system investment dollars that came during COVID. So. Um, that's something I'd love to follow up on after the call, Carlotta, because it's it's exactly the kind of thing we were hoping to create some you know experience with that we could share then with elected officials as they consider um, consider this going forward, and we can use some of those those catalyst dollars to to try it out. Great, thank you. Yep. We'll move back to the chat. Katie Joe asks, are HCBS rates for 1915I on the same schedule as other Medicaid funded services like DD? I honestly don't know. Yeah, I I I don't have any reason to think that that it wouldn't be because again, 1959 is a state plan amendment. Um we can follow up on that just to be hundred percent sure. Mm -hmm. But because it's a state plan amendment, um, and I know it's a special service, you know, set of service types within it, um, I would assume it's on on that same rate schedule. But we'll we'll follow up. 1959 are Medicaid providers, so I mean, I think I think anything that applies to Medicaid providers overall would would apply the same. But we can we can verify to be sure. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I see Maria posted some information on. Um, 
various investments, including that of personal care allowances. So that's great, thanks for sharing. Our next question is from Scott Burlingame. He asks, what is the status of the budget for vocational rehabilitation and independent living programming? Do, well, uh, I think. Oh, go ahead. Well, I think generally speaking, there weren't any new initiatives, but continued funding for going forward. So there's there's no changes, but the inflationary increases that all other base budgets had based on cost and caseload. All right, other chat comments. Looks like there's various resources being shared and some excitement about the AT pilot program you guys had mentioned. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, so one last question is you talked about in your presentation, um, working, continue to work on the redesign of eligibility determination, case management, provider enrollment. What's your vision for that? Okay. Go ahead, Jessica. I can, I can start with eligibility redesign um, and then maybe a little on provider enrollment, but it's actually um, more than a vision. It's almost a reality. So the, the redesign goes live on February 13th. So um, there have been dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of people working on this for a couple of years. And essentially what it means is all um, there will be a new um, central customer service center that will um, go live on that day as well. So instead of you having to call an individual zone or a lot of people actually move between zones between counties and they they struggle to know where to call they'll be able to call that main number and everyone on that line will have access and then cases will be processed by region so what it will do is help um, balance out the impact of high high case numbers in one area and maybe a little extra capacity in another so they can help each other out more readily the system will be designed to help them out and there have been a number of zones across the state that have already been kind of living into this a little bit and in a pre way and are already seeing some of the positive benefits of that of really helping improve timeliness for um, people who are trying to apply for whether it's SNAP, uh, Medicaid eligibility, LIHEAP, TANF for child care assistance. So that um, that change and how um, processes happen uh, will occur in mid February right around the same time that people will be hearing about state covered ND. So if the PHE does end sometime this spring, how important it is for everybody to make sure their address is up to date. That's really the main thing. You wanna make sure that if you're eligible, you stay eligible. And that means that everybody you know who is a, a Medicaid member has to make sure their information is current and that they reply when uh, they need to be re recertified, re-verified. So that is, that is coming. Um, we're really excited about it trepidatious and excited at the same time as any any big change, but um, really optimistic about um, the impact it'll have for people. And I'd say provider enrollment is right on that parallel path. We know that there are a lot, a lot, a lot of things we can do better. And so um, Nancy and Krista and Corey and many others are actively working to figure out ways that we can streamline that for providers. The QSB Hub was a good start, that partnership with UND, but much more, much more work to do and more to come on that, Veronica. Like we have a question from Dan Guya in the chat. Are you able to highlight specifics on which ARPA proposed policy measures are moving forward in the budget? So if you mean um, taking things that were previously funded with ARPA dollars and putting them into um, the state budget, I would say that there isn't a lot of that now other than early childhood. There are a few things in early childhood. Um, the ARPA spending um, deadlines actually go go through this um, by any in a lot of cases. So I, I don't, I, Chris, I don't know, tell me if I'm not thinking of things, but I don't think there's a lot of that inherent in this particular budget request. Um, other than early childhood, there are a few of those initiatives that were in the, the executive budget proposal. Yes. All right, this is gonna be our final question. Katie Joe asks, does anyone happen to know when the budget detail will be released on the OMB website? Yes, I think some of it will, but again, we have to redo our budget. So I'm, I'm going to use that as my current space right now. So we are working through that with the new budget system. So um, we will get it out there as soon as possible. Wonderful. I just want to give a big thanks to 
Chris Jones and Jessica Thomason from DHHS today. We really appreciate all the information you shared and um, we hope to be collaborating with you folks a lot during the upcoming legislative session. Yes, thank you all for your time and you. participation. It was The participation was wonderful. So, And just you. to let folks know, um, we will be sharing out the recording. So if folks wanted to share it with others who were unable to attend, that should be a possibility for people. So once again, thank you. Thank you.